Hey, hey, welcome, hey, welcome back, back to Clean Cut, Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about, just about anything, anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season we're talking about prayers, and last time we talked about the Apostles' Creed and discussed the difference between creeds and normal prayers. This time, we're going over another creed, which, aside from the Apostles' Creed, is probably said more often than any other, the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed goes back to the year 325 AD, when the first form of this creed was established at the First Council of Nicaea. It was the location of the council which gave the creed its name. However, that's not the version of the creed that we use today. Fifty-six years later, at the Second Council, which was held in the city of Constantinople in 381 AD, alterations were made to the creed, with the most notable change being the addition of several lines at the end, beginning with the words, We believe in the Holy Spirit. Several condemnations of beliefs held by heretics called Arians were also more explicitly condemned in the original version. The revised version became known as the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, but we shorten it to simply the Nicene Creed for the sake of convenience. Now let's look at what the creed actually says. We believe in one God. Once again, we start with the basics. Belief not only in God, but in only one God. This means that there are no other gods or goddesses, just one the Father, the Almighty. This establishes God's role as Father and His great power, Maker of all that is, seen and unseen. God made everything, both visible things and invisible things. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. Jesus is Lord, and only Jesus is Lord. This also establishes His role as Son, eternally begotten of the Father. Jesus' human life had a beginning on this earth in what we call time, but he also has another nature which has existed forever. Because only God has existed forever, this section also implies that Jesus is God, the Son to God the Father. Because his nature has existed forever, it never came to exist. However, it is in some sense still dependent on the Father, which is what's meant by eternally begotten. This isn't exactly a cause and effect relationship as we understand it, because both God the Father and God the Son are timeless. Still, one depends on the other. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. No ambiguity here. Jesus, who is God, comes from God the Father, each being truly God. This section was also meant to address the heresy of Gnosticism, which at the time made several claims about how the light inside people sought to escape from matter. The church correctly points out that the only true light in this situation is the light that comes from God. Begotten, not made. Consubstantial, of one being with the Father. Consubstantial means of the same substance. This means that God the Father and the Son have the same substance, although each is a different person. Through him all things were made. So not only did God make everything, but he made everything through the Son. The same truth is talked about in John chapter 1, where he refers to Jesus as the Word, and talks about how everything was made through the Word. This is because Jesus comes forth from God the Father, as words come forth from us. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. The reason why the Son chose to become human was to save us, to offer us a chance for salvation and everlasting life. This part also establishes the existence of heaven, and that Jesus was there prior to incarnating. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary. Both the Holy Spirit and Mary are mentioned here, implying that we believe in both, and we see here that Jesus was formed when the Holy Spirit made him in Mary's womb. This incarnation, however, shouldn't be interpreted as a sexual act. The Holy Spirit doesn't have a physical body, and you need one of those for sex. And was made man. In addition to being God, Jesus was truly human since the moment he was conceived. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was responsible for the decision that sent Jesus to his death by the cross. He suffered death and was buried. Jesus experienced actual suffering, death, and burial, just as other humans do. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. The scriptures predicted the resurrection, and Jesus fulfills the prophecies by returning from the dead on the third day after he died, according to the Hebrew method of determining these things. He ascended into heaven, 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Jesus rose into heaven after the resurrection to take his rightful place beside God the Father once again. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Jesus will return to earth one day, not in a subtle appearance like a normal human being, but arrayed in power and glory and stunning to behold. He'll return to earth in order to finally claim dominion over it, over or against all human authority figures, and when he does, he'll judge everyone, both people who died before that and everyone who's still alive when he returns. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. The Holy Spirit is also the Lord because he also is God. He's the one who gives life to everything living, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Son proceeds forth from the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds forth from both of them in a similar way, eternally, but not for the same reason. Maybe I'll be able to get more into this in the future. The precise relationships between the different persons of the Holy Trinity is an amazing and beautiful subject. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. Just like the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit is also God and is worshipped by people for the same reasons. In practice, unfortunately, the Holy Spirit tends to get a lot less attention than the Father and the Son when it comes to worship, though I'm not sure why that is. He has spoken through the prophets. The Holy Spirit inspires certain people to say certain things which he wants them to say. Some of these people were the prophets of the Old Testament who wrote about the various commands, promises, and ultimatums that God offered to the people of Israel. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. There is only one Catholic church which faithfully carries on the teachings and command structures of the apostles. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. As we covered in the episodes on baptism, one of the effects of baptism is to forgive sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. At some time in the future, the dead will be raised, and God will accept the faithful, body and soul, into heaven. This is the great promise of God. Next time, a prayer specifically to request the help of Mary. That's, That's all, for, all now, for now, so, so keep, keep asking, asking questions, questions and, thanks and thanks for watching. For watching.